Today we're going to read from Luke 3, 7 to 17. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Are you keeping up with your devotionals? If you don't have one, there's one up here, and I think I still have one um, at the house. But, of course, I can get you some. It seems like every time that uh, we're going through Luke 6, those devotions are right along with it, whether they're out of Luke 6 or not. And if you're reading those devotions, we are reading the same thing together. We are gathered together in spirit, whether we're gathered into body or not. The first one was living water this week. Do you know that living water? Are you going to see the king? You know that passage was um, based on John chapter 4 and the woman at the well, but in that um, devotion it said every one of us digs figurative wells all over the place that will never truly satisfy our careers, our marriage, our friendship, our families, our wealth, our next vacation or whatever experience gives us a high, but they all leave us thirsty for more. We'll keep digging and drinking until we're confronted by our real needs that our sin needs to be cleansed and forgiven. Our desires need to be transformed with our heart, and our hearts need to be filled with Jesus. He is the only one able to hold the weight of all of our hopes and longings. Or is your view on heavenly things? Or is your view distracted by the things of this world? The next one devotion this week was turned to the Scriptures. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it talked about that and said that Jesus understood the sufficiency of Scripture in every situation and modeled for us complete dependence upon it. In the face of temptation, he turned to the Bible to answer the evil one. Are you reading God's Word? Are you studying it? To be an approved workman that rightly handles the Word of truth. The next one was living the risen life. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And it went over the scripture from Galatians about the fruit of the Spirit, which I'll have in my sermon this week. Had it in there before I even got the devotion. It's just the way things work. Are you trying to live the Christian life by your own effort and fighting by your own strength? Or are you turning to the author and perfecter of your faith? Are you, as we talked about at men's breakfast, do you have the proper wedding attire on so that you know that you will be there at the banquet? And then the next one was think thinking deeply for God's sake. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Are you doing that in your lives? As we go through Luke chapter 6 today, we'll finish up the Sermon on the Plain. Those words that Jesus said to the twelve that when He came down off the mountaintop and He said, if you've decided to come and follow me, here's what your life is supposed to look like. So let's pray and we'll dig in. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your word, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus gave up heaven, he humbled himself, 
And he knew that it was going to cost him his life, and he was prayerfully dependent and spirit-empowered to live this life in the flesh of, the, of being a human being. But yet he didn't succumb to the desires of the flesh. He was filled with the Spirit, bound upon your truth, Lord. And we just thank you and praise you that he was a worthy, acceptable sacrifice, that you took your wrath out on him so that you could pour out your amazing love and grace upon us. Help us to not take lightly this salvation that we've, we have, Lord, but to live out our lives with love and mercy and grace as you have given us, Father. Empower us with the words of the Spirit today. Give us the strength to hear and obey. Increase our faith, Lord. Help the distractions of this world to be set aside and help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I name this a world full of fruit trees. Can you imagine just a world full of fruit trees? No other kind of tree, just fruit trees. You go out and eat these different kind of fruits, and you can be satisfied. But you know, some fruit trees are poisonous. Don't forget that in this world. So you have to know fruit, and you judge the tree by the fruit that it bears. We can only live a life that follows Jesus' Sermon on the Plain, if we've been radically transformed, if we've been born again by the Spirit, if we have a new heart of flesh that the Spirit is writing the words of God on so that we do not sin against Him. We have to have our eyes fixed on things above. We have to know that this life is not our own, that we were purchased that we are a new creation, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but now we've been made alive and we've been seated in the heavenly realms. If we realize this and keep our vision on Christ and we're prayerfully dependent and sanctified through and through by God's Word and through His Spirit, then we can live a radically different life, a sermon on the plain life. Is that the kind of life that you're living? Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. You know that. A good man brings, th brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So every time I have that thought and utter that word that is not godly, that is not even edifying to build up the brethren, that is not something that it would be a light in this world, that means that I still have some evil stored in my heart and I need to get rid of it. I need to get on my knees and ask for forgiveness and ask for my faith to be increased. Ask for the power of the Holy Spirit. Do I do this, though? Do you do this? Or do we kind of keep that tucked back in there and don't dig deep and get it out? And it's not us digging, it's let Jesus digging deep. Remember when Jesus said, if I can just dig around for a few more years, and then if not, cut it down. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. No good tree bears bad fruit. Each tree is recognized by its fruit. What comes out of your heart is what comes out of what your heart's full of. <clears throat> Would you say that Jesus is asking you, what kind of tree are you? In a world full of fruit, fruit trees. We didn't have other kind of trees. We we're only talking about fruit trees here. In a world full of fruit trees, what kind of fruit are you? Are you producing rotten fruit? Are you producing no fruit? Are you producing good fruit? Is it increasing in abundance as the maturity of the tree grows on? Are you producing in the seasons that you're supposed to produce? You will be known by your fruit, what's filled in your heart. So first of all, are you a fruit tree? <laughs> or do you consider yourself some other kind of tree? Are you a fruit tree? This is talking about fruit trees. So if I asked you, first of all, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior? Because there will be many, as we talked about again, that say, Lord, Lord. And he says, depart from me, I do not know you. And those many were what you would call disciples. 
you might call them Christians because they did mighty works in the name of Jesus Christ. They were zealous for the kingdom, but they did not have a relationship with Jesus Himself. They even cast out demons in the name of Jesus. But there's no debate that day. Jesus knows the difference. He knows your heart. And there will be a separation from the sheep and the goats. The trees that aren't fruit trees and the trees that are fruit trees. And the trees that are fruit trees that produce bad fruit. All that will be decided. You are going to meet the king and you will rejoice or there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus only gives two options here. Fruit trees, but good fruit or bad fruit. No other trees to consider, so don't think about anything else in this scenario. There's, there's a good fruit tree and a bad fruit tree. Both produce things that people eat, consume. And they either get healthy and life from it, or they get diseased and death from it, and they might not know it while they're eating it at the time. Jesus is only talking about fruit trees. So now I'm going to tell you like I would tell a child. What are fruit trees supposed to do? Bear fruit. Thank you. So are you bearing fruit? If a farmer went out to sow seed, why did he do it? So that the seed would grow and mature and feed to produce a crop. Every Christian is called to produce fruit. Fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is clear. It's love, patience, joy, peace, self-control. Are you doing these things and are they increasing in a harvest? Do others see this in you? Or does it look sweet from the outside but, but rotten on the inside or poisonous on the inside? So what does that fruit taste like? Think about that in your own lives and, and I ask again, what kind of fruit are you producing? Because you would be a hypocrite to say, all the fruit that I'm producing is good. You go to the store and you pick out fruit. The other day I bought some blueberries. They weren't fit to eat. They looked good, big, plump blueberries, but they were not fit to eat. You know you can sample fruit at Safeway too. Just know that. So if you ever see me over there grabbing a grape or whatever, I'm not stealing. They let you sample the fruit first. You can ask them to cut the orange open and everything. Because sometimes you can't tell the difference from the outside, can you? A lot of times you can, but a lot of times you can't. <clears throat> Jesus is talking about the difference between good and bad fruit trees based on the fruit that they produce. Many profess Jesus Christ, profess God, especially in this country, one nation under God. Who is that God? And did you come to know Him because of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Because if you don't have that personal relationship, you do not know God. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. It's by faith, thank goodness, not by works of righteousness, but by grace and faith that you're saved. So are you saved, and are you producing good fruit? So I'm going to ask you again personally, what does the fruit look like that you're producing? Surely you're producing some fruit. You are, even if it's the sins of the flesh, you're producing fruit. So don't think you're not producing. You're producing some kind or the other because people see that, especially if you profess the name of Jesus Christ and they're looking to see if your fruit is hypocrisy and hatred or if it's genuineness and love. There were 12 disciples contemplating discipleship. I'm going to take you back a few verses to verse 17. A great number of, number of people from all over Judea, Jerusalem and from the coastal region from Tyre and Sidon, a 50-mile radius, who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. So many people want what God can offer them, what Jesus can offer them, salvation. And it is by faith, but faith without works is dead. A fruit tree that doesn't produce fruit, first of all, is producing some kind of fruit. Like I said, in this scenario, it's just whether it's good or bad or not. And you should see it in ever-loving increasingness of love, patience, self-endurance, control, and so forth. Those that were loosely committed to Jesus, those who thought they were firmly committed to Jesus, those that opposed Jesus, and those that had signed up to be like their master, their rabbi, their teacher. 
and didn't have any idea that Jesus was going to preach this sermon the way he preached. That blessed are you when people persecute you, hate you, despise you because of me. And he gave the woes, the warnings that were out there. Jesus says, but to you who are listening, he gets to this point, to you who are listening, I've given these blessings and woes. Here's what your life is supposed to look like. So does it. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Be merciful just as your Father in heaven is merciful. Do not judge. Do not condemn. Instead, forgive and give. Is that what your fruit tree, what your fruit on the fruit, your fruit tree looks like? Oh, well, let's see. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. I'm going to admit again that if someone slaps me on the cheek, my first prayer, Lord, is probably going to be forgive them, but right after that it's going to follow. But why'd they do that, Lord? I don't want to be slapped anymore. Help them to stop slapping me. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, now if I'm praying a little bit with, with my spirit and with my heart, help me to love them so that they see your love, whether I'm slapped or not. Now, do I get to the point of turning the other cheek? No, I'm still not there. But this is what my life is supposed to look like. To you who are listening... Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, praise for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, lend them the other also. If someone takes your coat, give them your shirt as well. Give to everyone who asks. If anyone takes from you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you'd have them do to you. Love your enemies, do good to them, lend without expecting to get anything back. Be merciful just as your heavenly Father is merciful. Do not judge, do not condemn, forgive and give. I need a lot of pruning so that my fruit looks like this. And I know where to turn to do that. And it takes, you that know agriculture, it takes plenty of work to produce a good crop. And Jesus is there all the time. What amazes me so much in his last talks with the disciples is he continued to pray and pray and pray for them after giving them instructions. He's there interceding for us now. Jesus only identifies two types of trees again. It's not a matter of whether you're a fruit tree or not. It's you are a fruit tree. It's a matter of what kind of fruit are you producing. Are you just professing Jesus with your lips? Or out of your heart, the abundance of grace and mercy and love and the filling of the Holy Spirit in His words, is there good fruit being produced? And is it increasing? You know a tree by its fruit. Bad trees still produce fruit. Like I said, the problem is it may look good and everything else, but if it's rotten on the inside or poisonous, look what damage it can do. Is there abundant crop of fruit growing in your lives? So the next question is, what happens to a fruit tree that doesn't produce or produces bad fruit? Pretty simple again. It's cut down and thrown into the fire. It is completely destroyed. Luke chapter 3, we didn't go over, we started in Luke chapter 4 talks about that we're supposed to pr produce fruit showing that we have repented. John said that when he started out his ministry. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus began his ministry the same way. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You've got to change your way of thinking. I want you to live totally different 
I'm going to expound upon the, the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law so that you understand that if you harbor hatred in your heart that it's equivalent to murder. And as I said last week, I'll say again this week, murder usually is a, well, it is definitely a one-time event, but, but usually it's a one-time event of passion, r rage, whatever it is. But if you've had anger in your heart towards your, towards your enemy, your neighbor, your spouse, whoever it is, over and over and over every single day, then you've committed murder yesterday, today, and tomorrow if you don't get rid of it. Do you understand that's God's Word? Do you understand His love for you that He's lavished upon you? <clears throat> in Luke chapter 13, Luke writes about a tragic headline event that happened in the world. This is the headline news tonight. We watch it, and it's usually over politics, right? Pilate, so it's dealt with politics some too, had killed some people while they were sacrificing in the temple. How did Jesus reply to that news? You're going to get this as we get further along, but do you remember what it is? He says, I tell you, but unless you repent, you too will also perish. That's what happens in this world. We live in a fallen creation. Bad things happen. But we're called to be a light, to do good things, to be known by our good deeds. Then he told them this parable. This is Luke 13, verse 6. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone. For one more year I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit the next year, fine. If not, cut it down. So how many times has Jesus been digging, fertilizing, and said, you know, you need to make that right with that neighbor or that spouse or that child or whatever relationship it is? Did it result in you bearing fruit? Love, gentleness, self-control. Because if it didn't, you're not even taking effect of the, what Jesus is doing in your life. Unless you repent, unless you change your way of thinking to impact your heart so that it changes your behavior, you will perish. And he brings the example of a fruit tree that is not producing fruit and says, cut it down. So you can't use that scapegoat thing, well, I'm saved and everything, and not live for Jesus because there's a good possibility that you'll be cut down and thrown into the fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But if it bears fruit, the last, the last verse, fine. That's the opposite of that. If it bears fruit, Jesus will continue to nurture and cult, cultivate it and everything else to increase that crop in your life. In Matthew, we talk a little bit about it as well in the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 13 of chapter 7, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life. Only a few find it. Two gates this time. Which one have you entered? This narrow one that not many people find? Or have you entered the wide gate that leads to destruction? Even if you think everything's fine. Verse 15, watch out for false prophets. Remember, these disciples are going to be training other people and they need to know especially that they're living as Jesus has commanded, like Jesus in this world. So why in the world would you call yourself a Christian and not live like Christ? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Watch out for false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing. They look like sheep. But inwardly, their heart's still full of that other. Inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. And as I say again, a lot of fruit looks good on the outside, doesn't it? Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. 
And then Matthew adds these words. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now that takes me back to Luke's words of be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. So don't judge and you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. A positive command there. But it could be written just the same. Don't forgive and don't be forgiven. And then give. Give out of the abundance of your heart whatever that looks like in speech and in action because you understand that the biggest thing that you can give is love that will lead them to Jesus Christ. So we pray for the, our friends, our relatives and stuff because we're burdened. We weep now because we don't know about their salvation. And we live a life that produces fruit so that they can see Christ in us, not hypocrisy in us. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Wait a minute. Why is it twice in there? Martha, Martha. Have you thought about that? Jesus said, Martha, Martha, because he got her attention, first of all. But he also said, Martha, you know, I know you, Martha. I know you intimately. I know what's going through your mind. I know what you're facing. I know the pain, the suffering, everything else. I am the words of eternal life. Lord, Lord means that you not only call Jesus Lord in a casual sense, but you've made it your mission because you say that you know Him to live like Him. It's not a casual thing. It's Lord, Lord, don't you know that we're saved? And He says, depart from me, I do not know you. The only one who does the will of, uh, that will enter the kingdom of heaven is the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, who produces fruit that is countercultural to this world because they know that they've been purchased with a price and they need to live like Christ in this world, which means even turning the other cheek or giving on my shirt off of my back when they've asked for my coat whatever that looks like in your life. That doesn't mean that you're supposed to get run over. That doesn't mean in every instance you're doing that. It means that you have the heart of compassion to do that again, to save them. That you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Wouldn't it be nice if you're in a financial burden that somebody helped you out and said, don't worry about paying me back. Isn't that something you would like be done to you? Instead of being condemned, say, why are you in this situation? How much did you say you need? What's the interest rate? That's certainly not how grace was given to us. At just the right time, Christ Jesus died for our sins. But what does your fruit look like? Do you know what a pawpaw tree is? Do you? You're smiling. Do you know what a manchinel tree is? They're both found in tropical environments. You can find them in Florida. They both produce a distinctive fruit. Both are sweet to the taste. I like the one that's called pawpaw tree. I just like that. Um, do any of you know Spanish a little bit? You better know the difference in these two trees. Do you know them? Pawpaws are the largest edible tree fruit that lives in, nat in native North America. They grow specifically in temperature climates of the eastern parts of the United States. Pawpaw trees produce a large edible uh, green fruit that are ca also called pawpaws. The fruit is fragrant and has a distinctively bright tropical flavor. When they are ripe, pawpaws are very good fruit to eat. One bite and you'll enjoy one of America's best kept secret fruits. The manchinel tree can also be found in the same tropical climates. It leaves and fruit resemble that of an apple tree. It's also known as the beach apple. Sounds good, doesn't it? But in Spanish, manzanilla de la morte means little apple of death. It looks so good, but you'll bite into it and you wish you hadn't. It may not kill you. It tastes sweet till it starts burning and burning to where your esophagus is literally on fire. But it's not just that. Because by a fruit tree, you'll recognize them. The sap that runs through the tree has so many toxins in it. If you stand under the tree, 
and sap drips on you, it will blister and burn your skin. Even in the rain, if you go to seek shelter and it's diluted by the rain, it will put whelps and burn your skin. If you touch a leaf, it will burn you. Hmm, it looks so good and even tastes good. But that burning is very hard to quench and it can kill you. Don't you need to know the difference? You might be tempted to eat the fruit, but do not eat the fruit. You may want to rest your hand on the trunk of the tree or a, or a branch, but do not touch the tree trunk or the branches. Do not have anything to do with the fruit or the fruit tree. Do not stand under it. Do not even get near it. You know, if you throw it into the fire, the toxins can still burn your throat and blind you. You better know the difference in the fruits and the trees. By the fruit, the tree is easily recognized. And it is a matter of life and death. I wonder what Eve was thinking when she looked at that fruit and saw that it was pleasing for the eye. And that she would gain wisdom. Boy, that takes us right into the wise man who built his house, doesn't it? Just because it looks good, it even tastes good, doesn't mean it really is. One of the devotions we let this week, well, I read part of that one. You talked about all the things in this world that we try to fill our lives with instead of filling our lives completely with Jesus. I'll say again, do not eat, touch, or even breathe around the manchinelle tree. Have nothing to do with it. You are sanctified, set apart, holy unto God. Have nothing to do with the things that the pagans do in this world. Fill yourself with Jesus Christ, and out of the abundance that's filled in your heart, it will flow out. Back to Luke 6, verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its fruit. Yes, I'm repeating because I want it to sink in. People do not pick fruits, figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Lord, help me. In a garden full of just fruit trees, you better know the difference in the fruit before you take part in it. Or like I said, even stand or get near it. You choose blessings or woes, life or death. You choose Satan. Or you choose the king of all kings and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. We're going to see the king. It's just a matter of whether it be hallelujah or Lord, Lord. We did mighty things in your name. And you've got to consider, as the disciples had to consider here, are you a blind guide leading yourself into an eternal pit of destruction and leading others? Or are you fixing your eyes on Jesus and have eternal life. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus said, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. You know what the next words are? Probably not unless you turn there and you're reading them. It's just unusual that this is the next words. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. If you profess Jesus Christ with your lips but your heart is far from Him, you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You are not born again. You can say all you want to with your lips, but if your heart hasn't been transformed, you're not born again. How many times do we profess God with our lips, but our hearts are far from Him? We do have hypocrisy in our lives, and whenever we see it, we need to take it to the cross. 
Next words of Jesus, verse 34, You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For from the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Do you get the pattern here? A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. James, early leader of the church, has to write to the, to, to the Jews spread abroad from persecution, why in the world does your tongue do the things that it does? And then it goes to the actions that you have. I wonder if your faith is real or not. But I tell you that everyone will give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. So the first thing you need to check on that tree when you're checking fruit is how many times are the thoughts and things that come out of your mouth not glorifying to God. Because they came from your heart. Are you born again by the Spirit? Do you have a new heart? Is it producing good fruit? Galatians 5, and 23 says the fruit of the Spirit starts out with but, so it's contrary to the, the flesh. And if we read that list of flesh, we're like, we're not that. We tend to, to do that. But you, he is without sin, let him cast the first stone, right? <laughs> but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Is it in your life? Joy. Peace forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul's writing this letter because the church was running a good race, and then they got sidetracked because they kept looking at that manchinelle tree, or they kept standing near that tree. There were some tasting its fruit, others standing a little bit close, getting the toxins, whatever it was. We are supposed to be separated set apart, holy unto God. It is your reasonable and prudent act of service. And that's done by the renewing of your mind from the Holy Spirit as you leave this world behind. They started producing bad fruit instead of good fruit. They looked back at that poisonous fruit. They longed for it. Be careful. Walk with the Spirit. The fruits of the flesh are obvious, as that scripture says. But sometimes we don't want to see it because we're judging and condemning instead of forgiving and giving and being merciful as our Heavenly Father is merciful. Do not eat, touch, or even breathe around the manchinel tree because it can kill you. So I'll read again from Luke 6, verse 43 to 46. No good tree bears good fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What's the next verse? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Say that you're intimate with me, that you're listening to me, and do not do what I say. These words were to the twelve. These words to the pe were people that gathered there. These people were to all of them. So we can't sit there and say there are times that are, there are not times in our lives when we cry out and say, Lord, Lord, and he's sitting there saying, why haven't you been obedient to what I've commanded you? The Holy Spirit has been pricking on your heart, that neighbor again, and you've done nothing about it. Whatever the circumstance is, I don't know and I'm not here to judge. I am only here to preach this sermon and to walk us through Luke. Because these are Jesus' words, so we'll know that what we've been taught is true. We'll know what that teaching is so that we will live it. So that we will be like Christ. Oh, stumbling will come, but woe! to those who cause the stumbling. It would be better to have a millstone tied around your neck and you're thrown into the depths of the sea. Many disciples, and many Christians don't even consider themselves disciples, cry out, Lord, Lord. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when we go to meet the king.
Jesus is crying out to those that will listen. If you're going to sign up for this, <laughs> then live it without hypocrisy. Live it with genuineness. And you can't do it on your own. You've got to be sanctified through and through by the Word and by the Spirit, fixing your eyes on me, the words of eternal life. What kind of tree are you? Does your fruit just look good? Or does it taste good? That means you've got to examine it. Let others examine it. Does your fruit bring life? Or does it bring death? Well, this calls for wisdom, doesn't it? Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So many Christians don't even like to hear about the fear of the Lord. Hebrews eleven seven, 7, one of my two motto verses, says, Out of holy fear, Noah built an ark. I'm going to skip all the rest in the, in, the, in the middle, but it does talk about condemning the world and everything. But the end of that verse says, To save his family. Out of holy fear, we live a life, whatever that life is, whatever that calling is, whether we're ridiculed or not, no matter how long it takes, we're devout on it because we know we're going to meet the king. This is a call of wisdom to live your life out of holy fear, to condemn the world and save your family. Psalms 111. Praise the Lord, I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are His deeds, and His righteousness endures forever. He has caused the wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear Him. He re remembers His covenant forever. He has shown His people the power of His works, giving them the land of the other nations. The works of His hands are faithful and just. All His precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. This is our God. He provided redemption for His people. He ordained His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. All who follow His precepts have good understanding. How in the world could you call Him Lord, Lord, and not do what He says? You can't. You're a fruit tree that bears bad fruit. It's poisonous or rotten, and others eat it. Psalms 111 ends this way, To Him belongs eternal praise. I mentioned James before, so I'll read a little bit from James. James, 13, James 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by the deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom, where you can let someone slap you and you turn the other cheek. But if you harbor bitter and envy and selfish ambitions in your heart, in your heart again, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from, from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual. It is demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit impartial and sincere peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Verse 47, As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. You can't take that out of there. I will show you what they are like if you put Jesus' words into practice. If you hear and obey, let me tell you out of my mouth, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, what that man looks like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid a foundation in the rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck at that house and it could not shake it because it was well built. But the owner who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed. Its destruction was complete. You can't tell the difference from the outside of the house what the house is built upon. They look the same from the outside. 
But what's the difference is the foundation that it's built upon. Because without a solid foundation, when the storms come, and he's not talking about the storms of this life so much. We like to take that and say that this is what it is. He's talking about the storm that comes when you meet him face to face. This is how he ends out this sermon to those who said, I will follow you. He says, here's what you need to do. You need to call me Lord, Lord, and do what I say. You need to bear the fruit that I have told you to do. And then don't worry, because when eternal damnation comes, you have a solid foundation built upon me, because you've heard my words and you've followed them. Wow. It's the end of the Sermon on the Plain. Do you understand it? Do you take those words... To, to heart wisdom calls for you to examine your lives carefully and see how you're building to see the fruit that you're producing everyone builds are you building on a solid foundation there are many floods that come in life and things too and you can't apply that to that because you can weather all of those as well but the big torrent that comes is the day when this life is over and you meet Jesus face to face. And as Scripture says, you're accountable for every idle word, let alone for the life that you've lived. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice will stand for all eternity. So I stop here. Because that's the end of the sermon. And I ask you to examine yourself. And I'm going to be quiet for a little bit before I pray. You do whatever needs to be done. This is the end of this sermon. The, the, that day, the people had to decide, the crowds and everything, if they were coming to Jesus because they wanted their needs met or because they were coming to God Himself because He sent His Son to die for your sins, the God who deserves all praise, honor, and glory for who He is, and that He's lavished His mercy and grace and love upon you. Merciful, gracious, heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your amazing grace. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for our sins. We ask that you increase our faith. We ask that Jesus digs deep and pulls out all the hypocrisy, all the sins that so easily entangle Oh, Father, we thank You and praise You for You are worthy. Jesus, we thank You for giving up heaven, for living a life, for teaching us clearly. Give us salve for our blindness. Give us the spiritual food that we need. Give us that living water as You offered the woman at the well so we don't keep digging wells all over the place. Oh, that you would choose to come and die for our sins. May we not live a life that does not bring you glory and honor. May we not live a life that is hypocritical. But may we be a light to this world. May we realize that we need each other, that you didn't call for us to do this alone. That you've joined us together. That's why I say when we're reading 
these scriptures, these devotions, when we're not together in the flesh, we are together in the Spirit. Thank you for each and every one that is the body of Christ here. Lord, I also pray that whatever obstacles and torrents that people think they're facing in their life now, that you give them peace and that you give them an increasing peace in their life. That they fix their eyes on Jesus. Lord, help us to confess our sins. And the Scripture says if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Out of holy fear, Lord, help us to live the lives that you've called us to live, to build a firm foundation so that others, especially in our immediate lives here, see Jesus Christ. There's such darkness in this world today and such superficial religion. Father, let this be a church focused on you, Lord, empowered by your Spirit to do good deeds. I thank you for being a part. I thank you for my brothers and sisters that, that get to be a part of my lives. Father, we thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.